Hey, Kate, how's it going? Excellent. How are you? Doing great. Doing great. So we have uh, Kate Strashny uh, from Dedicated on the Data Nerd Herd. So for like the two people in the world who don't know who you are, do you want to uh, quickly uh, give an intro introduction by yourself? Yes, absolutely. Hello, Kate Strashny here. I am the founder of Dedicated and the Dedicated Academy and the Dedicated Conference more, more recently. I focus on helping brands reach an audience, mainly on LinkedIn through the Dedicated Media Company. The Dedicated Conference um, is focused on just getting a, the data community together and you know, educating the community on various topics, bringing in the very best speakers. And the, the third kind of aspect of my business, the Dedicated Academy is focused all on teaching people how to properly visualize their data and tell stories with data. I'm currently working on a fun project called Data to Dashboard Series, where essentially I would like to have probably around 15 or 20 different courses that take the user from data to dashboard using the same data to build the same dashboard across many, many different tools. So we've got Tableau Public, Power BI, ClickSense, Python, kind of all either completed or in the works, and then either 15 or 20 more uh, courses that are going to come up in the future. Have myself a mute. Um, that's awesome. And it seems like you are probably one of the busier people that I know of right now. So um, we can dive into that a bit, but I guess, you know, to kind of rewind, how did you get into the data space? Yeah, the data space actually um, came to me by accident, completely by accident. I'll, I'll tell the quick story here. I started out um, working kind of wanting to work in finance. So I wanted a job at a bank to do finance, whatever that meant at the time when I was in college. Uh, but I graduated in 2009 with a finance degree at the point where there was a financial um, crisis. And all of the banks that I really, really dreamed would be hiring me were all under a hiring freeze. So I had to get creative and through attending networking events, I actually ended up getting a gig selling risk management training to banks. Hmm. It was not really finance at banks, but it was close enough for me. Uh, it was my first corporate gig, so I was excited. But that led me to another role of um, working in risk management and eventually working at Deloitte where I was a risk management slash regulatory compliance consultant for several years. And it was at the point of, uh, I believe it was like 2014, where I was about to have my first child. And I remember thinking and vocalizing to my employer at the time how much I would like to work from home. This is pre-COVID, obviously, a long, long time ago where working from home was not the norm, um, as I'm sure it is right now. And I remember after several months of hunting and looking for potential work from home jobs, I was able to get this role as an inside strategy manager, which essentially kept me from home 98% of the time. I think I had to come in once or twice a month. And that role essentially introduced me to data visualization because the, the role was to take various data sets and I was given access to Tableau software. That was my first time ever touching any business intelligence software. And they basically said, hey, create some insights. Um, and I absolutely fell in love with data visualization. So it was 2014 that that happened. Interesting. And um, I guess, what did you learn along the way in terms of uh, what makes a good data visualization versus um, maybe a not so good data visualization? Yeah. So my first data visualization, it was actually funny because they gave me as a resource to some team to, I guess, train up. And the guy gave me a sample project, uh, which I thought was a sample project. So I'm like, okay, I guess I have some time to play around with this and kind of learn how to build. There was a specific scatter plot they wanted. And they're like, no, no, we need this by like tomorrow. So really build this, do a good job. I'm like, okay. So I took it more seriously. I built up this thing, which again, I thought was a sample project to teach me the ropes of data visualization. But apparently it was meant to be put in front of thousands of people of all like the new hires who joined the company. And it ended up being uh, used across the company as kind of the go-to visualization. But what I learned over time was there are very specific things you can do when you're visualizing data, very specific steps you can take to take a visualization from good to great. And I remember every time I iterated on the visual, because I would, I would learn things you know, by Googling or taking courses and reading books. The, the manager at the time, he's like, 
Kate, I don't know what it is you're doing or changing to the visualization, but it's looking better every single time. And it was very minor changes. It would have been, you know, uh, bolding some font or changing the use of, of color or making some things transparent or putting things in the, in the background or adding images, very small things that he couldn't even tell what it was, but he knew he liked it more. There, yeah, definitely some rules of uh, best practices there that can be followed. That's awesome. And then I, I guess now that you're running a dedicated academy, I mean, are you trying to teach people like the art of visualization or walk me through um, how that works? Yes, uh, exactly. So my main offering there right now is the dedicated storytelling course, which essentially takes you from the process of how do you tell a story with data, you know, analyzing your audience and um, making sure that you customize the visualization for its purpose. Then I have a huge section on visual best practices where we go over the proper use of color. Um, how do we reduce clutter from a visualization to really focus on the key messages? as well as a, a pretty lengthy section on choosing the right chart. So I've got this chart selector guide that walks you through best practices. Like when do you use a bar chart? When do you use a line chart? And you know, can you add 20 different lines to a line graph? And why is that good or bad? So yeah, I'm kind of on this mission to teach people the best practices and the little formatting tool uh, tips that you can make in the tools and going away from the default settings um, that most of these tools have because you that small customization can make things look so much better. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You mentioned data storytelling. Um, I mean, this is something that I know personally I'm seeing a lot more attention on. Um, I guess, what's your take on the, I guess, on the state of data storytelling right now and um, how it's impacting companies? Yeah, I feel like data storytelling is, I, I call it the last mile of analytics, because we put so much effort into collecting data, storing data, putting proper governance and making sure, we, you know, we're not breaking any GDPR rules and then cleaning it, wrangling it, combining with other data sources. But if we miss that final step of telling the story that the data is showing us, like delivering those insights to the right decision makers who can actually take action, if you get that part wrong, everything else um, you're basically doing for no reason, right? So why do you have so much data that you're sitting on if, if the right people are not getting access to it in, in time? So data storytelling, in my opinion, is the most important step uh, in that whole process. Yeah, I, think, I tend to agree. Like, I think anyone who's been in the data trenches for a while realizes storytelling is both like, um, it's underrated, because I think a lot of... Uh, Basically, a lot of more technical people, especially more like analysts, data scientists, they want to focus on like the uh, you know, the fun part, um, making models, um, writing code. But then, when it comes time to present those findings to a stakeholder, um, might be like a coin flip in terms of how impactful it is. Um, I guess for, for that those types of people, I mean, what any recommendations in terms of uh, how to you know learn. The, even the basics of telling a good data story? Yeah, absolutely. First, I'll touch on something. So you mentioned the, the technical people, right? And I think there, there's a probably a reason why they're not as excited about storytelling because those types of people who enjoy coding and building models, they get an immediate response, meaning if they have an error in their code, you'll get this thing that says, error, you've done this wrong, correct yourself. But data storytelling and communicating in general, yeah, you can kind of say, okay, the story sucked or it was great, but there are so many tiny nuances where you're not sure if it, you're doing the right thing or not. So I think maybe that's part of the struggle where it's not as clear cut, I guess, those soft skills. But in terms of how you can practice telling stories with data, I'd say um, the, the best way to practice anything for the most part is to, to do it. So I always recommend that people actually get some data. If you're focused on you know, just the data visualization and storytelling piece of things, get data that's in a ready format where you can, you don't have to spend too much time cleaning things up. Uh, basically, there's a, there's a site called makeovermonday.co.uk where you can get a bunch of free data, um, data sets and look at how others have visualized that data to get inspiration. But essentially, just build a story with data and then Go a step further, this might scare some people, but create a video of yourself 
telling the data story, right? And if you find yourself saying something, like if you're holding up the chart, um, let's say you printed it out or it's on your iPad and you're like, okay, focus here, but don't focus here and also look here. If you have to do all of that and tell people where to look, then you might not have spent enough time on the visualization side of things because your data visualization should speak for itself, right? Your title should give people the main takeaway. The you know, chart annotations or use of color can help you highlight specific parts of that story. So practice and actually do it. Um, and then, put, you know, if you want to go a step further, put it on social media and tag a few data storytellers or a few friends and ask for feedback from your community. Um, ask for actual feedback, not just, hey, man, great work. You're amazing. <laughs> That's great. You'll feel good about yourself, but ask for real feedback. Ask for the positive and the negative so you can actually improve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I noticed this was uh, something I noticed in um, Harpreet's uh, data science office hours a couple weeks ago. I think there was somebody pitching their um, data science project. And uh, it, it was interesting, the feedback they were getting. Um, the way it was presented was very uh, technically focused. Um, the outcomes were... Um, like I made all these cool charts in Seaborn and they're awesome. Look at how neat they are. Um, and, but didn't really address, okay, so like, why is this important? Why did we even go, what were we trying to address? That kind of thing. And, and it was good. The feedback that, um, you know, people, uh, in the group were providing, I think was, was along the lines of what you're saying, where it's like, this is, um, like figure out your audience, figure out who you're talking to. Um, don't lead with, uh, Python. <laughs> Or p values or, or something -values. else. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it's hard. It's it's hard to do though. You know, I don't know about you, but when I when I was starting out, I mean, uh, you know, I made that mistake of, I think, trying to show off with like a bunch of fancy statistics. And um, you know, I'll never forget my my boss. He's like, "Look, when I ask for the time, don't tell me how to like make a watch. Just tell me the time, right?" So. Yeah, I was gonna say when you go to the doctor, they don't say, "Well, I've used the stethoscope to measure this, and right. this is the outcome." God, and ramble off some numbers, and you're like, "Okay, just tell me something wrong with me or not?" Right? right. Like, get to the point. What's you know? What's the main thing? We're like talking about how what the materials of the stethoscope is made out of. Like, this is like really, <laughs> really nice metal here. This is you know, some people use you know, high end steel. Metal. This is high end. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you as a patient, like, yeah, I don't really care yeah way. exactly like doctor <laughs> so. i think be, be a doctor yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's, it's interesting um but it, it's one of those things that i notice that you know over the years i've been in data it's just uh i think it's just it's common i don't know if it's like a natural tendency for people just to want to dive in for technical people to dive into the technical piece first um not do storytelling um i don't know if you've seen a lot of the same things or have any have any thoughts on that matter yeah, and I think sometimes it's, it's you know, you spend so much time, <clears throat> let's say, playing around with things and something was broken. You kind of want to share your struggle. Yeah. I think that's part of it. You're like, oh, yeah, and then this didn't work. And then I think that people don't care. You have to realize that people only want the main outcome. Um, obviously, know your audience, right? There, There's a tiny, tiny percentage out there that might be very technical and just get really excited when you start talking in a technical way. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, if you're delivering... Um, insights from data, you have to stick to actually telling the story and focus on how does this relate to my audience and the things that they care about. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, earlier on, you mentioned um, you're doing a lot of activity on LinkedIn. I mean, walk me through that. Why, why did you uh, pick LinkedIn um, as kind of a main platform for your audience? Yeah, I didn't, I never start out, I never started out with, you know, thinking like, oh, I'm going to grow a following and build this community. Yeah. It actually happened when I was around the same time frame when I was getting into data. And I was like, what, what is this Tableau thing? I remember posting on, on LinkedIn, um, telling people I'm going to take the Tableau certification, right? And like three people commented. And I was so excited. I'm like, oh my God, people care. People are rooting for me. So I have to update them if I pass or fail. And then I'm like, I have to pass because I'm going to have to tell these people that I, <laughs> I failed. So I chose LinkedIn, I think, in the first place because people tend to use their real name. Mm -hmm. And I think that made a difference for me where on YouTube or even like Facebook, Instagram, anyone from anywhere, and not to say people can't do this on LinkedIn, but I think they can create a fake profile and there are so many more trolls and negativity, whereas on LinkedIn, 
it's just so very professional. I rarely had to face any kind of weird people. Well, sometimes, but very rare compared to other platforms. Um, I think the professionalism of the platform and the engagement that I got early on really motivated me to keep posting and keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, by all accounts, I think you've built a, a pretty large following by this point in the uh, data community. So, I mean, it's cool to see. I mean, what, walk me through the progression real quick. I mean, you say you got started just posting a, hey, y'all, I'm going to do the Tableau cert um, to today with, with Dedicated. I mean, what was that? Um, what was that progression journey like? Yeah, so... It, it's actually an interesting story, at least for me. Uh, so I started posting a bit more. Like if I learned a new cool thing in Tableau, I would create a video on YouTube, mostly for myself. So I can go back to that video and kind of refer to it like, oh, that's how I figured this out. But uh, people started following me unsubscribing to my YouTube channel and kind of like, oh, Tableau training. And I got into that. And I, I think I always enjoyed teaching people. So I kind of got that my little outlet on YouTube but then I would share the links on LinkedIn just to kind of help spread the word. And I think it's an addictive feature of, you know, getting positive feedback and then you kind of want to put more stuff out there. So moving forward, I think it was probably 2017 or 2018 where I met up with a group of people and we actually had our own data science office hours that I was invited to cool. join it was um, before LinkedIn ever had a live feature. We actually went live on YouTube and we simply sat there and focused on a specific topic. And then we would take questions from the live audience. Um, and then it was the year after that, that LinkedIn actually called me one of their top voices in data science and analytics. And I remember getting that email from LinkedIn. I'm like, really? Like there's so many amazing people out there. You really think I'm a top voice? Okay, great. Um, and then the year after they did the same thing and I was on the list again. And I think being nominated will put, put on that list of top 10 people in data science and analytics really helped um, my confidence. First of all, I was able to just, I posted a lot more and it also helped with the followers because people see you as, oh, if she's a tough voice. Maybe she talks about something important in data. So that definitely helped. Nice. Yeah, it seems like it would be like kind of a uh, like a self-reinforcing feedback loop too. Yeah. So, that's awesome. I mean, and, and, and I suppose you know, um, any tips or tricks for people wanting to like build their social media following or? Um, oh yeah, anything like that? absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with this tip number one: post, post content. It's so funny when people are like, I'm not getting followers. I'm like, yeah, you posted once this year. <laughs> What's your, why would people follow you? Let's get to the bottom of it, right? Why do you follow people? Well, I started following specific people because of the content they post, right? To see their post in my feed. And once you understand that, then you understand that you need to post and post on a very frequent basis. I, I don't recommend any sort of schedules. This is my personal preference. I know they're definitely people out there that live by this, but I, I don't enjoy telling people that every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Eastern, they have to post. That's just weird for me. That's so robotic and auto, like automated. I, I feel like in terms of posting schedules, I literally post whenever I want. It could be at 2 a.m. on a Sunday. It could be at 11 p.m. on a Monday. It doesn't really matter. Uh, as soon as I get the idea or the question in mind, I just go ahead and post it. Sometimes it's you know, eight times a day, which could be excessive. Sometimes it's, you know, three times a week when, when I'm busy with other things. But um, I think I'm on there at least once a day during the week. I think weekends, I do take a little break. But yeah, so tip number one, post. Tip number two is post regularly. Three, I'd say be authentic. So being yourself is so helpful and so easy that people, I don't know why people don't realize this. They try to build up a persona um, when they're online, like this is what I want to be known as. But I feel like it becomes difficult to keep that up. So I think just being yourself. So if you're just starting out, let's say in data science or whatever field, and you want to start posting, don't pretend you know more than you do. Be the person who's posting as the beginner and other beginners who are on that same journey will want to hear from you, right? They don't want to hear from the expert who has 45 years of experience, or well, maybe they do, but a lot of times people want to see others like them on that same journey. So they're more you know, able to relate to you. 
I'm going to stop there because I can probably spend three hours talking about LinkedIn posts. <laughs> That's fine. And I guess what, what makes a, a good LinkedIn post? Uh, I'd say it's something that you genuinely care about. Let's say if you have a question that you're asking, um, if you actually care about the answer, I think that that that's a good start. So what do I mean by this? At some point, I I had an issue, right? I had like a hundred different CSV files that I needed to com combine into one and visualize something. And I posted that question on LinkedIn. That probably was one of my best posts ever in terms of number of comments and engagement and all that. And oh, I remember this post. Yeah, you see, there you go. And I, yeah. first of all, I had so many great suggestions and I tried to respond to as many comments as possible. But I think what made that post great is the fact that I actually cared about the answer. I didn't post it just because I thought it would get engagement. Mm -hmm. So for me, a, a good and effective post is something that accomplishes a goal. And for me, the goal is literally getting this answer because I tried Googling it and I got a whole bunch of different suggestions. And now that post still lives on where people are still commenting on this um, things like six or eight months later. Um, but anyways, I think there there is a slight formula you can go with. And number one is avoid including <clears throat> external links. So anything that takes eyeballs away from LinkedIn is probably not a good thing because LinkedIn wants people on LinkedIn. Um, using two or three relevant hashtags is, is effective. Um, not custom hashtags that you just dreamt up, you know, last night, actual hashtags like hashtag data or, you know, hashtag analysis, you can, uh, you can see how many followers each of those hashtags have. And the reason that becomes important is um, it helps your post to become a trending post. So sometimes LinkedIn will share it more broadly if people who follow the hashtag engage with it. Um, and then adding images and videos and, you know, things like that, that's, that's totally up to you. I've noticed kind of mixed responses for things like that. It's, it's hard to tell if one is better th than the other. Um, but anything that's engaging and, and keeps a person's attention uh, is typically good. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, by the way, on that, uh, on that post, did you, did, what answer did you pick? Oh, I went with Power BI. It was so <laughs> easy. So you just um, upload, you click like in upload CSV and you select all of them, like kind of control A, select all in the folder. Or I think I uploaded a folder of CSVs and then it just combined them all. It was magic. It took like two minutes. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I noticed it was it it, it it was interesting because I noticed in the threads it became sort of this contest um, to see who could come up with like the um, either the wittiest answer or um, you, you could tell like all the software engineers are trying to like one up each other with their replies. Um, like, oh, I, I, I can do that easier. Look at this. Um, or yes. more complicated. So. Yes, uh, absolutely. Kind of yeah. like presenting your data analysis, right? Here's the more, most complex way you can do this. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, thanks. But I'm looking for an easy way. Right. Yeah. And it seems like, and it was, it was, I think your, your, uh, the one you chose was, was interesting too. Cause I think I gave like a programmatic answer to it. Um, because that's the world I come from, right? But if you're doing in Power BI, then why would you, why would you inflict that on yourself? Yeah. <laughs> yes. But that's that's interesting. Yeah, and on, on LinkedIn too, I have noticed it's it's been kind of hit and miss with um, even internal videos like uh, LinkedIn native videos. I've noticed um, yeah, pretty sporadic responses on that. Sometimes they're, they do well, sometimes not. It's usually for the almost identical thing, so I don't know what's going on there, but. Well, the one thing for videos, they tend to get less views mm -hmm. because I think views are calculated differently for videos versus, let's say, images. Mm -hmm. I think for images, it's just impressions. If a person paused there for a second before they scrolled versus videos, they actually have to watch, I believe, at least three seconds. I don't know if that mm -hmm. rule has changed. So sometimes you'll see it as a lower count. But in terms of being successful or not, I think you have to ask yourself what success means to you yeah. personally right and some people it's just getting a whole bunch of views and likes um a lot of times that's probably not the right metrics to to strive for because if if that's your goal post some cute puppy videos right like if you just want likes that that will get you likes it'll be weird <laughs> unless you're like in the puppy business and that's what i usually tell people i think success is defined as um 
getting whatever you wanted out of that, right? Mm -hmm. So in my case, it was getting an answer from a question. It ended up being a popular post, but for me, I got an answer for, for my question. Other times you simply want to increase, you know, brand recognition for companies, or if you want to be well known for, you know, whatever X might be, then continuously posting on that specific topic, no matter how many views you get, if people keep seeing content from you on basketball, well, guess what? Whenever they need anything related to basketball, they're going to contact you. And I've definitely seen that a lot for data analytics. Um, I got contacted for anything related to Tableau when all I did was talk about Tableau um, like six years ago. So, mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, back to Dedicated. I mean, how, how long have you been doing Dedicated? And uh, I guess walking through that. Uh, process too, like why did you start it? Um, uh, everything. <laughs> so. Everything. Okay, everything. so it's March 16th. <laughs> I actually started it March 20th, 2020. So almost exactly a year ago wow. is when I officially went off on my own and started. Um, it used to be called Story by Data. The company is mm -hmm. still called Story by Data, but I recently rebranded, so now it's dedicated because it just makes more sense. Um, the reason I started it was it started with the term dedicated, which means dedicated to data and kind of has a play on my name in there of Kate as well, the sound of Kate. Um, I think I, I essentially I started it as more of a blog initially where I would just jot down my thoughts and the YouTube channel. Um, I interviewed people on the Human to Data Science show, so I kind of needed a place to put all that. And that, that's kind of how it started before I even went off on my own. It was just collecting my thoughts in a central location. But now the dedicated thing has actually taken off where I'm trying to build this into like a real brand. So I've got dedicated merch out there where people can actually get dedicated t-shirts and sweatshirts and pillows stuff like that. I forgot the, the conference, which I'm really excited about. That, that also happened kind of by accident um, in October of last year, where I, I held my first conference. And it took me less than two months to go from thinking about, hmm, maybe I should run a conference to actually running a conference. And then it went so well that I ran another one in February of this year. And I, I'm going to have another one in May coming up uh, later this year with an industry focus. But one thing I'm doing with the company is, is experimenting in every direction. So I've got a, a podcast. I now have a medium publication as of today. And whatever I see, whatever comes my way, I'm like, yeah, okay, sure, I'll try that. I, I don't spend much time sitting, thinking, strategizing, and planning. I typically just take action without much thought, which, again, going back to, you know, how do we learn data storytelling and things like that, I definitely take my own advice and simply take action. So the best way to learn how to do something is literally to just do it. Um, so that's that's a little bit about dedicated. That's awesome. I mean, you started it right as uh, I guess the world was um, going through some changes uh, yes. last year. So um, I mean, what are your thoughts? I know it's kind of counterfactual, but if you do, you think that. Um, you would have had a similar level of success um, if COVID wasn't in the picture and we're kind of just going about how things used to be. Okay, so I'll be fully transparent. It, this was March 2020 when I took, you know, took my business out by, by myself. Um, I didn't know it was going to be a global pandemic because at that point it was just like, you know, a virus in China and kind of spreading. It wasn't like you know, okay, schools are closed, major lockdowns mm -hmm. when I made this decision. So if I were to do it again, I probably would chicken out of it and might have not mm. pulled the plug this early. Who knows? Maybe I would. It's hard to tell. But it actually worked out really well for me. So A, I had an excuse. If my business fails, well, hello, we're in a pandemic. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it kind of gave me that little cushion of, um, of a, uh, you know, protecting my self-confidence in case something didn't work out. But it ended up truly helping my business because the academy is online. Mm -hmm. The conference is virtual. The media partnerships um, truly took off because the companies that used to go to in-person conferences and sponsor those events, well, they had marketing budget, 
but nowhere to spend it. And they need to get, you know, they need to get leads and they need to get in front of, in front of an audience. And my LinkedIn live show um, provided that opportunity. So things definitely aligned really well for me. Um, I'd say I got pretty lucky with, with how things worked out. That's awesome. Yeah, I know in my experience too, the, the last year, um, I guess before COVID, right, I was very provincial doing a lot of kind of in-person stuff in my locality, but I think COVID just opened the doors for a very global audience that I, I don't know that I know personally I would have paid as much attention to just because it's so busy doing like, a, you know, local, local stuff. Um, yeah, I know it's, it, it, it's, it's fascinating too, just the, um, the number of people that you end up uh, interacting with, right, in, in new mediums, like an online conference. If, if you do that in a, in a pre-COVID world, I, you know, people are like, well, why can't you just have like a, like a real conference at, at a Sheraton or something? I don't know. So, but, you know, everything changed. So. Absolutely. I, I agree with that. I remember when I started this whole dedicated thing, um, I was thinking in, in my future, there will be a dedicated conference. I didn't think it would be that same year. I didn't picture it to be virtual, but I remember clearly thinking this was August, 2020, end of August, where I was contemplating doing an online event. And I'm like, hey, why not? Like, I don't have to buy food or get a venue. I could literally just do this on LinkedIn Live, which is kind of my main selling point for my dedicated conference is that it's on LinkedIn Live. Anybody can jump in and out. Um, mm -hmm. People, I mean, I'd love for them to register this way. I can send them reminders and actually let them know when we're live. But people can literally jump in and out whenever they'd like versus most even online conferences, you have to register, right? You, sometimes a very lengthy uh, registration form. You also have to, you know, a lot of times get specific software installed so you can attend the event and, Sometimes those things crash. And if you met somebody in a chat, which a lot of the conferences don't actually have a chat feature, but if they do, you have to find them where? On LinkedIn. You're like, which Joe was this? Oh, I don't know which one I met. Well, the beauty of a LinkedIn live conference is anyone who's chatting in the live feed can actually just add each other as a connection and, and get um, keep networking. So that was my goal there, to allow that networking feature. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um... Yeah, as a quick aside, like a, a, was it March 11th, I did a uh, in-person um, workshop. And the funny thing behind that was, I think, to, to illustrate your point about like friction of just having an in-person event, it was like the, the uh, event um, facility that I, I had picked, they went bankrupt like three days before the event. Oh, my God. So I was like, um... Does anyone have like an office that we could use for an event for like 30 to 50 people? Um, thankfully, uh, you know, a friend uh, had an office that we could use, but just that kind of stress. And then on top of it, like everything's getting shut down like that week. So people are like are dropping off of attendance because they're like, yeah, my, my company's not letting me go to any in-person events anymore. I'm like, well, I totally get it. Um, and I was about to cancel it actually, you know, the day before, but everyone had flown in from... California and uh, Colorado and other places. And it's like, you can't, can't do this. Right. But, you know, fast forward to virtual events now and it's kind of a moot point. Um, yeah. and the thing I do notice about virtual events, I'd like to get your take on this is like, do you, I, I sometimes notice that there's maybe a sense of like, kind of a, like virtual event fatigue and how do you keep events interesting? Um, especially now that we're kind of, a, you know, a year into um, uh, everyone basically looking at each other through cameras Yes. Um, okay. So here, here is my feedback on, on virtual events. I think, first of all, it's, I think it, people shouldn't be charging for online events. That's just my personal view. Well, they can, right? Free country, free world, whatever, do what you want. But I think it's a lot less um, enticing for people to pay for a virtual event, especially since, you know, a day after there are recordings on YouTube. Oh, in case you missed it here, check out the content. It's like, okay. Why am I paying? Unless you're actually giving people something live in the moment. Um, so from that perspective, I hope to never have to charge for the, um, uh, for the events as long as they remain online. I, I get it. With in-person events, you kind of have to because you're getting the venue and the food and whatever else might come with that. 
Um, in terms of keeping people's attention, my goal with my events is to keep talks to 10 minutes. So I have 10 minute lightning rounds. This way, if you're, you know, truly not feeling a, a conversation or a speaker, well, you wait another couple of minutes and here comes another one. Because people are, you know, their attention span is, is, is shorter. Um, and also nobody wants to sit in front of a screen for 45 minutes listening to one person continuously go on and on and on. Uh, I try to limit the use of slides in presentations. In some cases, it does help to kind of balance things out and have people use slides. But mostly I try to focus on face-to-face yeah. -face kind of here I am conversations. Um, so keeping things moving, having that live engagement part of things and have interesting speakers. I know that's kind of self-explanatory, but be very selective in terms of who you actually put on camera some people might be geniuses, but not great speakers. And in that case, just make sure you at least balance the, you know, energetic speakers with maybe more of the um, technical talk. So yeah. there's so much that goes on behind the scenes of planning and organizing and, and scheduling all the talks. Truly really my favorite part though, is picking, picking the right speakers to deliver the right talks. Uh, there's so much stress in, in that, especially people you've never met before. Um, so I tend to, before I ask a speaker to speak, I tend to YouTube them at least just to see them on camera. So for anyone who's you know interested in speaking at events, I don't know if other conference hosts do this, but it definitely helps to either be on podcast or um, create your own YouTube videos so people can get a sense of how you speak. Yeah, for sure. That that could probably go either way if you weren't, <laughs> weren't careful. So <laughs> good job in vetting people. Um, yeah, I know I run meetups too, and it's kind of the same thing. I, I, I should probably do a better job at vetting some speakers, but uh, it, it tends to work itself out. <laughs> so if you're gonna, I think it, it's it's sort of interesting because it's it's self-selecting. Like if you're going to volunteer to speak in front of that many people, um, uh, the the stage fight alone kind of I think uh, uh, weeds some people out. But then again, yeah. you, you always get the one person who's like, "Yeah, I've never done this before. I'll give it a shot." And <laughs> so, um, but. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, with the dedicated too, I mean, you, like I mentioned earlier, you might be one of the busier people I, I think I've ever seen. Um, I mean, you're uh, raising kids, running a company. Um, I mean, and you seem to be everywhere as well, all simultaneously. Um, so I guess, are you cloned or are you just like uh, really effective in managing your time? And if so, how do you do it? Um, thank you. Yes. In addition to running the, the company, I also like running long distance. So mm. that's, yep. that takes up time too. Um, awesome. but yeah, no, there's definitely no cloning. Maybe <laughs> one day, I hope. Um, I, I don't have a person helping me at the moment. I, I might look into hiring at some point soon to expand the team and kind of take some of this on, but I feel like it, it sort of goes to, to um, prioritization and, and time management, something I, truly really enjoyed doing since I was probably a kid it was like trying to make the most of the time that we have in a day, in a year, in a month, whatever. Um, but for me, I think I always tell people, it's like, you know, when you watch Netflix and you can watch like 50 episodes of your favorite show, the work that I'm doing is my Netflix. Like I rarely watch TV. I, I sometimes watch TV, you know, when I'm eating but I can't like sit down and watch a movie for two hours. That's hard for me. Like if me and my husband want to watch a movie, it's going to take us a week to get through one movie because he'll watch TV every evening. Yes. But for me, like we'll turn it on for about 15 minutes. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go do stuff. Um, so for me, I think it's the lack of interest in the things that um, a lot of people spend time on that can be considered productivity killers and the things that I actually enjoy doing happen to be posting content or um, talking to people or creating these live shows. So it just so happened that I enjoy the work I do. So it makes it easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it definitely helps when uh, I, guess, I was talked to my wife the other day about this. And it's kind of like, I think I've lucked into a field where it doesn't feel like work at all, um, which is nice when you're working 12 plus hour days every day. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I better not feel like work because that's going to be miserable. Um, yeah, I definitely relate. I mean, similar type of schedule, I would say, where it's just, uh, um, I read a ton in the morning, but every, everything's pretty segmented. Um, 
and uh, any high priority stuff that involves like heavy thinking is done in the morning. Any tactical admin stuff is done in the afternoon just because it's um, how I'm wired or probably wired differently or similar nodes. So yeah, but it's time management, uh, I'd say both challenging and necessary. So. Absolutely. And one thing I'll add that I, I didn't say the, um, before is I also like to wake up at five o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. There's not much unproductive things you can do at five o'clock in the morning. Like you're not going to binge watch Netflix and eat junk food at 5 a.m. You just won't. Well, that speak annoys. for yourself, but just kidding. <laughs> really? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't. I can't even eat at that time. So I bring my laptop downstairs and like at 5 a.m. it's still dark out. My kids are sleeping. My husband's sleeping. That's when I get a lot of my work done as well. Mm -hmm. um, my actual work work. Then my call schedule is like, you can book time with me uh, through my Calendly at 7.30 a.m. and 8 a.m. or 2 p.m. and 2.30 p.m. Eastern. That's it. I This is actually a new thing I, I just implemented. So I only have two short blocks of time where I actually take calls. Then nine to two is my homeschooling time. Yay. So much fun. I'm in pre-K and first grade at the same time. Oh, wow. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. Wow. Um, yeah, we're similar. I get up really early probably around the same time you do. Well, not literally the same time because we're different time zones, but um, yeah, I do find those morning hours to be like probably the most productive because, you know, I mean, slam a cup of coffee and, um, but it's your time, right? Because if you have kids, like it's just constant interruptions and, you know, it is what it is, right? As parents, you just get used to it. But like at that time when like there's nobody else up, uh, those are precious hours. Mm -hmm. And no one's calling you. Nobody. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's, it's the perfect time. If you can wake up at that time. And I, I also go to bed around 10. So yeah, I definitely I get enough sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a, exactly the same schedule. It's pretty hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I woke up at like four forty-five this morning. Um, and I was like, I guess it's close enough to five. I don't know. Like, but you're not going to get back to sleep. So just deal with it. Yeah, exactly. If you go back to sleep, I think you have to sleep for 90 minutes because the REM cycle, otherwise you don't get good quality sleep. So mm -hmm. yeah, then a lot of times you wake up before mm -hmm. five. So how uh, you... this week, I've... oh, go that... ahead. No, what are you saying? No, I was just going to say that this whole week I've actually turned off my alarm because I'm, I'm still sort of in recovery from that, that David Goggins challenge from um, mm. last weekend, where it was kind of up through the night uh, for 48 hours, kind of on and off and running. So I, I gave myself a, a break from waking up early, but I ended up still waking up around between 5 and 6 a.m. Makes sense. For uh, people who don't know what that David Goggins challenge is, uh, maybe quickly describe it. Oh, yeah, sure. So um, David Goggins basically is a crazy man. He created this challenge um, where you run for 48 hours. For me, it started at 11 p.m. Eastern on a Friday night. And then every four hours, you basically run four miles, which doesn't sound so bad, but after about 20 miles, you really start to feel it. So it was a total of 48 miles um, that you run through a weekend and you, you basically don't get much sleep. I think total was probably anywhere between one to three hours over, um, over the two days, because it's, I don't even know at which point I fell asleep because as soon as I fell asleep. I heard the alarm go off like at 2.30 in the morning. I'm like, oh my God, okay, got to run again. Um, and it was freezing. I did this in New York uh, where I live uh, where it was like 20 degrees out um, and very windy. Not pleasant. When you guys get cold too, it's like really cold. Well, I mean, it was 20 degrees. So it was, uh, this is yeah, Fahrenheit. Yeah. No, when you have humidity, you have humidity though, though, out where I am. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like 20 degrees is like t-shirt weather for you guys. Um, so, cause it's dry here, right? Uh, you don't have the humidity. So, and that, and the four hours is interesting too, cause it seems like that's enough of a break between running where your muscles start, um, kind of relaxing a bit and getting sore. Yes. So remind my muscles it's the worst. So I ran a 50 mile run before in 2019. I actually did that in central park where I looped, uh, I think it was like a 1.3 mile little a water reservoir and I looped it like 35 or 38 times to run 50 miles and that was fine like I was fine because it took a full day like 12 hours or so 
But this one, every time you stop running, you're like, okay, let's relax, mm -hmm. take a shower, right? What, are you going to shower 12 times in two days? I don't know. I didn't know what to expect. I mean, how many times do you change your clothes? Because four miles is not that much of a distance where you're like gross after, but you're just gross enough to feel gross. <laughs> so yeah, it was the most challenging part was the relaxing because uh, you can't really sleep. I don't take naps. So I couldn't sleep daytime even though I wanted to. And you don't know how much coffee to drink to kind of balance out the sleepiness and the, the, the kick you get from your coffee. I would definitely do it again, though. Um, it just sucks that it was so cold. Uh, that was yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, some friends do that here, too. It sounded, uh, um, sounded okay. <laughs> I think I passed. But, you know, for me, I think the, big, the biggest part would not even be the physical challenge. It'd be more the mental, right? Because in that four-hour break, you're like, well... I mean, maybe, maybe I've just done enough and, and maybe, yes. you know, maybe we don't need to continue on this. Um, that I, definitely happened exactly halfway through. So my hips just stopped working. Like my legs just stopped going like this. Okay. And I'm like, what is happening? Cause I guess you relax, you know, if you ever done a big workout the next day is when you really feel it. Mm -hmm. So that's what was happening. I, my body was starting to try and recover where I kept abusing it to go more um, and I did this challenge with my brother. Okay. I convinced him to do it because I didn't want to be the dumb girl outside in the middle of the night on, on right. the street running by myself. Right. So I'm like, Hey, you should totally do this. He's very competitive. So clearly he's like, yeah, he even like he slept in my basement. We have a bed there. Anyways, it was great. And I text him in the, in the middle of the night saying, Hey, you ready to go? And his response is like wrong number. Who this? I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> you're in my basement i can find you but every ran every every time we ran he would ask me the same question like why why are we doing this and halfway through he's like maybe we just stop because he was clearly also feeling it and i'm like but we're halfway through it's it is that whole psychological like why should i keep going no one's watching no one's making me do this right i didn't sign up for anything there's no accountability but for me it was you know just because just to see if I can. And in my head, I'm like, of course, like I told myself I can, I rarely tell myself I can't do something. Um, so Interesting. yeah, glad I did it. Huh. And you also, uh, run Spartan races. Yes. Yeah, so 2019 was a big year for me. I, I did a couple of things. One was that 50 mile run. Nice. One was running a thousand miles in a year. That was my goal to run, um, a thousand miles, which, if you want to do the math, it's like a 5K or a three miler every single day. But I broke it up into different runs. And yeah, I wanted to do the Spartan trifecta. So I did that one in 2019 as well. Uh, that was fun. And Spartan keeps emailing me saying they're open again, but they doubled their prices. So I don't know if I'm going to do it this year. I might. Oh, interesting. Huh. Yeah. I guess because they're so popular. I don't know, because they, they were closed all last year. Um, and I guess people missed it. Yeah, I know I had to I had to defer a bunch of races to this year. So actually I'm supposedly gonna be doing um no I'm doing a well I signed up for doing a trifecta in a day. Um in July. In a day? Mm-hmm. Well in a weekend, sorry. Okay, okay. So how would this start? Like do you start with a sprint? I think I'm doing the beast first. Okay. And then it's a super and a sprint the next day. Mm -hmm. So, and then I think in, what is it, 10 days or something, I'm supposed to go to Vegas and do a, uh, was it super or something like that, just to go try it out and see how it goes. Have you done Spartan races before? Or... Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. I was actually training with a friend of mine up in, he lives in Beacon, um, okay. just a bit north of you. Uh, he was a, uh, um, I guess he was a professional uh, Spartan racer, if that's even a thing, but that's like literally all he did. <laughs> so, yeah, so I went to his place and just trained there for, um, you know, a week and uh, he showed me all the, uh, cool tricks to do to, um, make your life slightly better. Like what? Can you share a tip? Um, yeah, I mean, and some of the obstacles really like if you're, um, like the sled drag, like just go and make sure, like, pre scope it out and like kick any rocks out of the way before you start doing it. So just all these tips that just make your life a lot easier, um, taking salt on the, on the runs, um, and just how to do the obstacles better. Um, like the hoist, like throw your legs on the, uh, 
um, barricade mm -hmm. and use it. Yeah. Yeah. And then the spear throw, we did a lot of spear throwing. She's like, you know, half the time it's a coin flip. You may do it or you may even like top pros I know. do it or don't. Yeah. So the spear throw is so unpredictable. I, we didn't even practice that one. It's like, it's like <laughs> just like lob it yeah, <laughs> flops on the ground. And you're like, yeah, burpees everywhere. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, did you find the obstacles uh, challenging coming from a running background or how, how did that all work out? So the running part was great. I mean, there were a lot more hills than I'm typically used to. At mm. some point, we could barely walk because of how vertical the hill was. We were mm. like using your hands. Um, for me, I think the monkey bars and stuff like that was pretty pretty easy. Climbing over walls, I actually enjoy doing that. Um, nice. I'm, I'm currently training to do pull-ups, so that's been a lot of my tw nice. uh, 2021 training is a lot, a lot of attempts at pull-ups. So that actually will help um, with, with the wall climbs. But for me, the hardest part was the lifting heavy objects. Mm. It, I don't know. It's just like the, the big, the Hercules lift and all those things. It's, I don't know. Some of them I just didn't even do because I'm like, this will literally break my back. <laughs> like why? So. so you end up doing like a, like a bunch of burpees. So R reminds me of my sister. Like she, uh, so she can do like, what was it? Like six miles, uh, like six minute pace, maybe less. So pretty, really fast. I took her in a Spartan race. Uh, I think we got dead last um, as, a, as a group because uh, she failed every single obstacle. I think she ended up doing well over um, like 210 burpees or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. So just because uh, she can run really well, but when you get to the obstacles, it, it's like, well, oh, yeah, I mean, we, we practiced. So I have two brothers and a sister. We were kind of all into fitness in one way or another. One of my brothers is the only one who runs, but the others, like we do these monkey bar challenges. We're also very competitive. So like mm. we go to dinner to somebody's birthday party. We all live near each other. Chances are all of us are going to be doing pushups at one point in time. No so like, especially after eating and drinking, um, um, mostly the men, they start like, okay, let's try this challenge. I'm like, okay, I'll get the first aid kit. You know, like something's about to happen. So it helps with the, with those obstacles when you kind of grow up in that environment. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> well, maybe you can uh, challenge them all to the pull-ups once you're uh, yeah, right? busting those I out. do it with a band, with a resistance band. So I can't do a real pull-up just yet. Although my husband thinks I can, um, I still don't think I can. I have just believe it then it might happen i think you could i, I uh had the fortune of, of teaching people how to do pull-ups um quite a bit actually so i used to climb oh, really? a lot so i still do but yeah so but in uh um yeah i always find it, it's uh bands are good but doing like negatives so like yeah. just slowly release yourself and then try and do this like that helps a ton um and then yes. add, yes, add weight yeah and weight uh-huh so I have a weighted vest. Part of my my thing in 2019, I mentioned that thousand miles. Uh, in December, I had a hundred miles left, so I bought a weighted vest to run the last hundred miles with a weighted vest because why not, right? Challenge yeah, why yourself. Not? Uh, just... Yeah, it was not easy. It's actually pretty hard running with an extra. You know, it was like ten or fifteen percent of uh, my body weight. So. Was... Mm. Yeah, we use this in a uh, CrossFit uh, sometimes. There's this uh, workout called Murph. Um, it's like, uh, run a mile, uh, hundred pull-ups, uh, 200 push-ups and 300 air squats. You can break it up however you want though. Right. So if you want wow. to do it in, in sequentially, you can kind of like mix it up and then it's another, um, run, but it's with a weighted vest and, uh, it's done every Memorial day. You should, um, hmm. try it sometime. Cause it seems, yeah. like, it seems like something you would do actually. So. seems like something I would do. Exactly. <laughs> like, Oh, that seems really crazy. And, uh, maniacal. Let's do that one. Um, yeah. yeah. Speaking of races, I know you posted the, uh, uh, the warrior race there. So, um, if, uh, if fortune has it, I'll, I'll make it out to New York for that. So you should fun. totally do this. So, uh, again, 2019, it was a big year for me, 2019, mm -hmm. damn you COVID. Like my 2020 was ruined. My 2019 was awesome. I did the Warriors run. Um, so for those who are not familiar with it, I'm going to assume less people are familiar with Warriors than they would be with even Goggins. It's essentially a recreation of the escape route from a 1970s film called The Warriors, where they're escaping this. Um, it's, it's basically a bunch of New York City gangs and they're 
um, escaping their death by running from somewhere in the Bronx near a cemetery, which is actually where we met up. Joe, it was like midnight, first time meeting a, a group of people. It was like probably 20 or 30 people. No and I'm, I don't even have a count because it was complete darkness at the cemetery where we met. But we ran 28 miles from that point all the way to um, to Coney Island. You can pick your own route as long as you hit up um, two different train stations. I think the 96th Street train station and the Union Square 14th Street, where you have to literally go into the train station and, and run the station. Not the railroad, just people get confused. Like, oh, we have to run, <laughs> you know, where the rats are. I'm like, no, not there. <laughs> On the actual platform. Um but yeah, it was it was definitely one of my best running experiences. We ran through the night and got to Coney Island right at uh, sunrise, and then literally just like kept running into the water um, and went for a swim at the beach. That sounds like a lot of fun. Can you stop and take yeah. breaks and like get pizza and stuff on your way there, or you can do whatever you want? You're not running. Okay. There is no set route. You literally yeah. go from point A to point B however you want, as long as you hit up those two train stations. Um, I think, you know, take a picture there or a video or something. Yeah. But it's an underground run. Like, it's not a registered official run. You just... That sounds more fun. Yeah. And I think that's in the movie. That's kind of the, the uh, sequence of it, too. Like, going to the... Uh, I can't remember train station. I'm not from New York. But, yeah. I mean, it's, that seems to fit the route. You know, they end up in a Coney Island at the end. Um, alive, thankfully. Sorry for the spoiler, people. Um, but it's an old movie. You should watch it. So I'm going to watch it again um, this summer, right before, maybe a couple times. I, I, I bought it last time on YouTube to watch it and then ended up watching it a bunch of times. It's, it's a good movie. And mm -hmm. I wanted to know all of the kind of the people and the gangs and kind of what to expect, especially since I never met the actual people running the event. Um, we all met at that one point in time. So it was fun. That's awesome. Well, cool. Um, well, I guess it's a good way to wrap it up too. Um, for people who want to get a hold of you, what is the best way for them to do so? Oh yeah, great. So there's something called LinkedIn. Um, I highly recommend it for people. <laughs> so like... LinkedIn's probably the best place. Okay. You heard of it? Uh, is it like Clubhouse? Um... It's sort of like Clubhouse, yeah, okay. but not. Oh, I am on Clubhouse by the way. So at Dedicated across most social media, um, I think Twitter is the only one I couldn't get at dedicated because somebody took it. So there I'm at dedicated with an underscore at the back. I had no uh, choice. Crazy. Somebody took my name. I know it's crazy. But yeah, LinkedIn or dedicated.com is kind of my central site for all the things that I work on. So cool. Are. And your next conference is when? May 18th and 19th, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern. Nice. Awesome. Okay. So always, it's been fun. So we'll uh, hopefully talk again soon and maybe go on a run too whenever uh, all this stuff's over. So. I'll see you in August, man. You're doing this. Awesome. Thanks for having me on the show. Of course. All right. See ya.